Hello again. Welcome. Today we will talk about the tabular simplex method. In reality, if you have understood the mechanics of the algebraic simplex method, then you have understood the simplex method. It doesn't matter if the simplex method is algebraic, tabular or in matrix, the mechanics is always the same. The only difference is the presentation form. Let us start by overviewing some concepts and by recalling the steps of the algebraic method. The problem we saw the previous session is the following. And the first step is to transform each inequality into an equality. When the constraint is less than or equal to we add a slack variable. And when it is a greater than or equal to we must subtract a surplus variable. Usually, we denote these variables with the letter S. I will erase the original problem, to show you how to represent these equations in the tabular form. In the tabular method we create a table that contains a column for each of the variables. In the gray row we will place the objective function, and in the other rows we will place the constraints. Let me start by placing the first constraint in the table. The first constraint is 2x1, plus x2, plus s1, equal to 20. In the row corresponding to the first constraint we will place the coefficients of the variables. If a variable does not appear in that equation, its coefficient is 0. In this way, the row that corresponds to the first constraint will have the following values. Now we will place the values of the variables in the rows that correspond to the second and third constraints. Observe that the values found on the right hand side of the equalities appear in the last column of the table. To write the objective function following the same pattern, we must rewrite it in the following form. Now we are ready to place the equation in the table. Recall that in the algebraic method, we tried to find a solution to the system of equations. To recognize the variables that have a value different from zero, versus those which are zero valued, we looked for the variables that appeared in only one equation with coefficient one. In the simplex table it is even easier to find them, since these variables will have the coefficient 1 in one row, and zeros in the other rows. These variables are called basic variables. And in this case, S1 will be basic in the first row. S2 will be basic in the second row. And S3 will be basic in the third row. If S1 is 20, S2 is 18, and S3 is 8, then the value of the variables X1 and X2 is 0, and therefore the value of Z is also 0. We will try to increase the value of Z, by making X1 or X2 greater than 0. To know which of these two variables should increase, we observe the objective function row, and search for negative numbers. If this is the case, we select the smallest of them. This means that x1 will be transformed into a basic variable and its value will be greater than 0. Now we must look for which basic variable x1 will substitute. To find out, we must know which constraint limits the most the increase of x1. Recall that in the last video we said that if the coefficient of a variable in a constraint is 0, or negative, the value of that variable could increase with no limits in that constraint. But if the coefficient of that variable is positive, then a simple way to identify up to what value that variable can increase in that constraint is to divide the value of the constant by the coefficient. Now we select the row with the smallest value. This means that the variable x1 will be basic, and s3 will no longer be basic. The construction of the second table, 
starts considering the number found in the intersection of the variable that enters the basis, and the variable that leaves the basis. Now we will start the construction of the second table. Our basic variables will be S1, S2 and X1. We start by placing the row of the entering variable in the second table. This row will be the same as the one in the previous table, divided by the number indicated with the red circle. Since in this case that number is 1, then the row in the second table, will be exactly the same as the row in the first table. This row is known as the pivot row, and I will mark it with the red color. Recall that for the variable x1 to be basic in the third row, its coefficient in that row must be 1, and must have 0 coefficients in all the other rows. This means that the values of minus 7, 2, and 1, that appear in this column, must be transformed to zeros. Let us start converting minus 7 to 0. To convert it to 0, we multiply the pivot row by the negative of the number, and then add it to the original row. That is, we multiply the pivot row by 7. And now, we add it to the row where the minus 7 appears. And place the answer in the objective function row of the second table. 0, plus, 1. 7, minus 7. 0, minus 4. 0, plus 0. 0, plus 0. 7, plus 0. And, 56, plus 0. In the same way we converted the minus 7 into 0. Now, we will convert the 2 into 0. We start by multiplying the pivot row by minus 2. And now, we add it to the row where the 2 appears. The result of the sum will be placed in the S1 row. We are almost done filling the second table. All that remains to be done, is to transform into 0 the 1 that appears in the S2 row. We multiply by minus 1 the pivot row. Now we add it to the S2 row. And the result is placed in the new S2 row. Now the second table is complete. Again, we must observe the objective function row. We must find out if negative numbers still exist. If so, we select the smallest of them. This means that the variable x2 will enter the basis, and now we must determine which of the variable will leave the basis. Recall that the new entering basic variable will enter in the row corresponding to the constraint that limits the most the growth of the variable. In the first constraint, x2 can increase up to 4 units. Recall that to determine this, we divide the constant by the coefficient of the variable in that constraint. In the second constraint, the variable x2 can increase up to 10 units. In the third row, the coefficient of the variable x2 is 0. Then the value of the variable x2 can increase with no limits. Given that we select the constraint that limits the most the growth of x2, then the variable x2 will enter the basis replacing s1 in the first constraint. Let me reduce the size of the information to explain the third table. Now, we will observe the number found in the intersection of the entering variable and the leaving variable. We move this row to the third table dividing it by that number. Recall that the new basic variable in this row is x2. This is the pivot row. 
and with this row, we will convert to zero the other elements in the x2 column. Let us start with the minus 4, we multiply the pivot row by 4. And add it to the objective function row. The sum will be the new objective function row. Now we will convert into zero the number that appears in the S2 row. We multiply the pivot row by minus 1. And add it to the S2 row. The sum is the new row of S2. Finally, since the number found in the column of x2 and the x1 row is 0, then the x1 row in the third table will be exactly the same as in the second table. We have finished the third table. But there is still a negative number in the objective function. And therefore, the variable s3 must enter the basis again. In the first constraint, given that the coefficient of the variable s3 is negative, then there is no limit for the increase of this variable. In the second constraint the variable s3 can increase up to 6 units. And in the third constraint up to 8 units. Therefore, the variable s2 will leave the basis. We will reduce the information to make room for the fourth table. Our new basic variables will be x2, s3, and x1. The number found in the intersection of the entering and leaving variables is 1. So, that we move this row dividing it by 1. And now we will convert the other elements in the S3 column into zeros. We multiply by 1 the pivot element. And add it to the objective function row. This will result in the new objective function row. Now we must multiply by 2 the pivot row. And add it to the row of the first constraint. We will place the result in the row of the first constraint. Finally, we only need to transform the last element in the S3 column into zero. To do this, we multiply by minus one the pivot row and add it to this row. and we place the sum in the row of the third constraint. This is the fourth and last table. The way we can conclude that we are finished, is observing that there are no negative coefficients in the objective function. The solution is, x1 equal to 2, x2 equal to 16, and s3 equal to 6. s1 and s2 are not found in the basis, and hence, their value is 0. Before we finish the presentation, I would like to show you a comparison between the two methods. On the left, I will place the systems of equations obtained with the algebraic simplex method. And on the right, the tables obtained using the tabular simplex method. It will be very convenient to pause the video for a few moments to compare the systems of equations and the tables, to verify that they are totally equivalent. This comparison will help you understand that both methods are exactly the same, and that the only change is how the information is presented. In the upcoming presentations we will show you other special features of the tabular simplex method. A thousand thanks for your patience. I will see you soon.